Tonight, heads of the Independent National Electoral Commission and the National Youth Service Corps discuss ways to ensure the security and welfare of core members during the forthcoming general elections. Governor Zulum gives the assurance that Borno State is 90% safe for the conduct of elections, says voting took place in the state in 2015 and 2019 when the state faced an even worse security situation. Education comes under the spotlight tonight as we end our 2022 sectoral performance assessment. On business news tonight, economic advisory firm Financial Derivatives Company forecasts Nigeria's headline inflation lower at 21.28% in December, its first decline in nine months, ahead of official report from the NBS. And on sports news tonight, Italian Football Federation announces all matches this weekend will be preceded by a minute silence to honor Gianluca Vialli, who died after a long battle with cancer. From Abuja, Governor Nesam Wike of River State challenges the new board of the NDDC to do things differently, urges the commission to adopt a regional development approach in the execution of projects. And in international news from London, a unilateral ceasefire called by Russia appears to have had little effect on fighting on the ground, with officials accusing each other of opening fire on several areas. They don't just make up a large chunk of the voting population, they're also critical to the success of the polls. They are young Nigerians serving the nation under the National Youth Service Corps, who will be drafted as INOC ad hoc staff across the over 170,000 polling units in the country. Well, seven weeks to the polls and the need to prioritize their security and welfare is on a firm burner. As the chairman of INEC, Professor Mahmoud Jakubu meets with the acting director general of the NYC, Mrs. Christuba in Abuja, to address the gray areas. The chairman of Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, arrives at the conference hall of the National Youth Service Corps, NYSC, along with some INEC national commissioners. The INEC chairman is meeting with the acting director general of the NYSC to fine-tune arrangements for the participation of core members in the forthcoming general elections. We are here basically to thank you, the acting DG, and to thank the NYSC for your consistent support. The truth is that INEC can't conduct elections successfully without the NYSC. That's the truth. Youth Corps members form a big chunk of ad hoc staff for the electoral umpire during the conduct of elections. And INEC would be needing more of your services next month following the increased introduction of technology for the exercise. The National Youth Corps members are our most reliable, most readily available, most educated, most patriotic, the largest number of election duty staff in the country. So we simply can't conduct elections without the support of the UCO members. And this is very important, particularly now that we are introducing increasingly more and more technology in the conduct of elections. While promising INEC of its continued support, the acting director general of the NYSC appeals to the electoral body to scale up the security and welfare of core members who will participate in the elections. We need to uh, work in our, in our present uh, reality. There is need to look at review of the allowance paid to the core members in view of the prevailing economic reality. Also on our part, we have directed all state coordinators to rise with DSS and other security agencies to identify crisis-prone areas in the state and forward same to the um, headquarters. It's less than 50 days to the 2023 general elections, which will commence with the presidential and national assembly elections on February 25th and exercise the electoral umpire is depending on core members for its success. Meanwhile, Governor Babagana Zulum of Borno State has given the assurance that the state is 90% secure and safe for the general elections. The governor stated this after a private visit to President Muhammad Buhari at the State House in Abuja. 
In a chat with correspondents, he asked voters to collect their PVCs, saying that the people of Borno State voted in 2015 and 2019 when the security situation was more dire. The people of Borno State have voted during the 2015 election. They have also voted during the 2019 election. Can you compare the security situation in 2019, 2011, and 20, now? The security in Borno State has improved tremendously by over 90 percent. So we don't have any problem. Voters, eligible voters, can go and cast their votes on election day, inshallah, in Borno State. We don't have any problem. Our rehabilitation and resettlement is also going very well. Uh, we are looking forward to see how we can uh, rehabilitate uh, Meduguri, Gamborungala Road, and then Meduguri Banki Road with a view to opening up opportunities for the people to earn their means of livelihood. And also the campaigns, the All Progressives Congress presidential campaign says the president has indicated his readiness to join the campaign of the party's flag bearer, Senator Bola Tinubu, in some states to canvass for votes ahead of next month's election. A statement by the campaign spokesman, Mr. Festus Kiamu, indicates that President Mohamed Buhari is billed to join the campaign train in at least 10 states. According to him, the states are Adamawa on Monday, Yobe on Tuesday, Sokoto on January the 16th, Kwara on January the 17th, Ogun on January the 25th, Cross River on January the 30th, Nasarawa on February the 4th, Katsina two days after, Imo State on February the 14th, and the grand finale in Lagos on February the 18th. The president had earlier attended the flag off of the presidential campaign in Jos on November the 15th last year. And to Ogun State, where Governor Dakwa Biodo has flagged off his re-election campaign with a visit to Imeka for local government area in Ogun West Senatorial District. He was welcomed by a large crowd of supporters, APC leaders in the state, and party faithful. Addressing the gathering in a carnival-like campaign, the governor promised more infrastructure development, purposeful leadership, hinge on transparency and accountability if re-elected. Acknowledging cheers from supporters and party faithful, Governor Dakwa Biodrum makes a triumphant entry to his re-election campaign kickoff in Imeko Afo, local government area of Ogun State. He is accompanied by his wife, members of the state's executive council and top APC officials. Many residents of Afon, Ilara and Imeko gather en masse in solidarity. <laughs> In his address, Governor Biodun promises more development in critical sectors of the state's economy and urges the people to collect their PVCs. You must all go and collect your PVCs. The deadline for PVC collection is now 16th, 15th of January. They also praise the governor for his support as they seek continuity, which many believe his re-election will achieve. In Ogun State, APC will win, hands down. You see, before you declare that a party will win, you want to look at the effort of other parties. As of today, what APC is doing is far ahead of all others are doing. We, we, we find it very easy and um, very welcome in all the local government. And there's even development, even progress uh, across the 20 local governments of Ogun State and virtually every ward. There is no ward in Ogun State you will get to where you not see what we call the yellow roof revolution, even in healthcare. Despite this pass mark and recommendations, the residents are clamoring for more development in areas of education, road infrastructure, and many more. The road network in the West is nothing to write them about. We want the government to please, 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 and please come to our assistance. Many infrastructures we left behind. We want the governor, we are solely behind the governor that we all do, please, to come to our aid in the West. The campaign rally was rounded off with distribution of empowerment items to some residents to improve their means of livelihood. 
The Labour Party is promising to pull surprises at the presidential polls come February due to its mobilisation at the grassroots. The Deputy Director General of the party in Lagos State, Sir George Aminalo, gave the assurance during the swearing-in ceremony of some executives of the party in Amuwadopi local government area. Mr. Aminalo says their confidence is also due to the readiness of Nigerians to change the narrative of governance in the country. We notice that we cannot do anything without first of all getting the grassroots fully involved in the electionary campaign. And Amu Odofi is a local government in Lagos State, and Amu Odofi is central to the success of the Labour Party in Nigeria, just like every other local government, every other world is central to our success. Every word counts, every vote counts, every local government counts, and having united the various interest groups of Labour Party in Amu Odofi, we are sure of victory at the polls. We are promising to deliver 100% across board. It's not an overstatement. We know our strength in Amu, and we are convinced to deliver Labour Party 100% because we believe in PO. We believe in our principal and his deputy, his vice. We believe they are men of honor. We believe they are men of integrity. We believe they are disciplined. We believe they are honest men. So how can we reward honesty in Nigeria? How can we appreciate diligence? How can we appreciate discipline apart from supporting those that have manifested these qualities? Each time I hear that, I feel grateful to God that we are being underrated. Those who think our strength is only online will be shocked. We are organic in structure. We don't even believe so much in posters and billboards again because the image of Peter Obi and Ahmed that is registered in our heart. The presidential candidate of the All Progressives Congress, Senator Bola Tinubu, is again assuring Nigerians that he's offering himself for the presidential job to create an enabling environment that will unlock the creative abilities of Nigerian youths. Speaking at a town hall with youths in the nation's capital, the former Lagos State Governor says their support is important in building a better Nigeria, being the dominant population. The APC candidate also threw a jab at former President Ulusheng Mabasajo and the PDP presidential candidate Atiku Abubakar, saying that if elected, his administration will not engage in the kind of squabbles that characterize their administration. For the skills, my expertise, my passion, my track record to bring in to you a better tomorrow. Tomorrow that we have manufactured goods for other nations to buy. Tomorrow that we utilize our gas and all God-given resources to sell to Europe. You just know why I'm picking. My running mate, Kazim Shetima and I, are giving you an assurance a renewed hope. We will not abuse each other in Wuse market like Obasanjo and Natiku. I want to mention their name before. But I can't help it. In part two, after the break, education takes the center stage tonight as we end our 2022 sectoral performance assessment. Well, that's at the moment. Do stay with us.
Hey, welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10, live on channels television. A reminder of our main stories. Heads of Independent National Electoral Commission and National Youth Service Corps discuss ways to ensure the security and welfare of core members during the forthcoming general elections. Governor Zulum gives the assurance that Borno State is 90% safe for the conduct of elections, says voting took place in the state in 2015 and 2019 when the state faced a worse security situation. Education comes under the spotlight tonight as we end our 2022 sectoral performance assessment. And a unilateral ceasefire called by Russia appears to have had little effect on fighting on the ground, with officials accusing each other of opening fire on several areas. Into the courts now, where the Court of Appeals Sokoto Division has set aside the judgment of the Federal High Court that nullified the primary election of Mr. Dauda Lawal Dari as the governorship candidate of the People's Democratic Party PDP in Zamfara State. In a unanimous judgment read by Justice Babakar Talba on behalf of others, Justice Talba said that Mr. Lawal Dari and the two other appellants have succeeded in proving all the seven grounds of appeals canvassed by the councils and all resolved in their favor. Justice Talba said the trial judge was wrong to discountenance documents submitted from INEC as the trial uh, court did not stipulate the period of conducting rerun election and notices of participation. The primary election was challenged at the Federal High Court in Gusso and the court ordered for a fresh election which was conducted on September the 23rd and also quashed by the same court for regularities. Justice Talba awarded 200,000 Naira as costs to appellants against the respondents who are Ibrahim Shehugasal, Badatao Madawaki, Hafiz Nauche, and Ainek. Well, the education sector in Nigeria was a major headline for most part of 2022. No thanks to the eight months industrial action by the Academic Staff Union of Universities. While also President Mohamed Buhari did not meet the global benchmark of allocating 20% of the nation's total budget to the education sector, despite the year recording the highest allocation to education in the last seven years. Nevertheless, the federal government made some key policies in the sector within the year. The year 2022 began on a rather quiet note as the academic session commenced in earnest with many students returning to school. That resumption euphoria was cut short for students in public universities. What started as an initial industrial action on February the 14th snowballed into an eight month long disruption of academic activities. The lecturers were protesting unpaid earned allowances, non release of university revitalization fund as well as the non-operationalization of the University Transparency and Accountability System, UTAS, which is a payment platform designed by the lecturers. There were several attempts to resolve the issues, but the federal government and the union could not come to an agreement. All these issues we are discussing, we can resolve it in one way. If this country is to declare emergency education, because of what we are seeing today, we will solve this problem in less than three days. I don't think that we will waste too much time in adopting the things of as I have said, because uh, we have agreed on certain things and put time limits on them. When the negotiations did not yield much result, the government approached the judiciary to intervene. A recommendation by the appeal court for an out-of-court settlement did not force the lecturers back to the classrooms. <laughs> In what appears to be a move to break the union's ranks, the federal government registered the Congress of University Academics, CONWA, a splinter group from ASU. In the exercise of the power conferred on me as former Minister of Labor and Employment, do hereby approve the registration of one Congress of Nigerian University Academics, CONWA, two Nigerian Association of Medical and Dental Lecturers in Academics, NAMDA. Following the failure of the government to resolve the issue, the Speaker of the House of Representatives led the renewed negotiation to get the lecturers back into their classes. <laughs> Nevertheless, students are glad to be back in school. We're happy. 
that we are coming back to school. You don't expect to receive salary after you've not worked for but the past seven months. However, the lecturers did not back down in their efforts to ensure that the demands are met as the union held protests in various parts of the country, including the nation's capital. The lecturers are further protesting the payment of half salary by the federal government in October. The speaker has also read. He has intervened and we've given him the honor to do the needful. The strike has been called off and the, the government has paid them what is due to them. While the crisis remains unresolved, the lecturers are back in class. The Academic Staff Union of Polytechnics went on a two-day warning strike in May. The government was successful in resolving the issues. The Colleges of Education Academic Staff Union issued a three-week strike notice over unmet demands on May the 25th. The strike started after three weeks and dragged till August the 12th when the association called it off. <laughs> The crisis in the education sector is not limited to just industrial action. There were issues of poor funding. For instance, President Buhari reneged on his promise to raise federal government's budget for education to meet the global benchmark of 20% and a far cry from the 26% UNESCO benchmark. According to the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, the number of out-of-school children in Nigeria is estimated at about 20 million. And there is no indication that the figure reduced, as admitted by the education minister. I came into office with the result to remove out of school children and their failed. In the result of the May June 2022 West African Senior School Certificate Examination, the West African Examination Council, WIEC, announced that about 1.222 million candidates, amounting to 76.36% of the 1.6 million candidates that successfully sat for the examination, obtained credits and above in the minimum of five subjects, including English language and mathematics. Some key decisions taken by the government on education in the outgoing year include sustaining the school feeding program and the plan to teach in local languages at basic schools. A rather controversial policy, with the government yet to release operational guidelines on it. The government has agreed now instruction in primary school. The first success will be in the mother tongue. Meanwhile, the president is yet to sign the student's loan bill passed by the National Assembly in November. The plan of the bill is to create a Nigerian education bank which will have the power to award student loans. Now for more insight into how the nation fared in the education sector, we're joined on the news at 10 by the former Vice Chancellor of Veritas University, Abuja, Professor Michael Kwanashi. Well, good, evening, good evening, Prof, and thank you for joining us on the news at 10. Good evening. Happy to be here. Right. Almost everyone speaks highly of education, saying it is a bedrock of a society. It is uh, the best legacy. But in reality, would you say that education got the kind of attention and seriousness it deserves, both from government and stakeholders in 2022? Uh, certainly not. Uh, I think 2022 has been a very uh, challenging year for that sector, for the education sector. Uh, right from the grassroots level to the university level, uh, schools, it's not just the, the, the strikes and the protests, you know, the security situation in many parts of the country also made life unbearable for institutions. Uh, the cost for running institutions at the lower level, especially in the private sector, skyrocketed uh, because of inflation. Uh, security uh, efforts to mitigate the security challenges. But this year has been a very, very, very difficult one for the education sector. Not just the public sector, not just the public part of it, but also the, the, private, uh, the private sector. And in talking about prioritization, I think, I think it's a main issue for, for the sector. And we have all, always paid lip service to education. There's no doubt that given the trend in, in, in the global economy, the, 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 the need to, to develop the, the knowledge economy, to promote the knowledge economy, is pivotal, even for the economic level of our nation, for our ability to, con to compete uh, globally. No, nobody's in doubt. We are not in doubt of that. 
but we are not prioritizing to even lay the, the groundworks uh, to ensure you know, that we promote knowledge economy right from the grassroots, that we empower our people. Uh, the number of out-of-school children is, 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 is embarrassing. Mm. Um, and, and, and still, policies don't seem to you know, be able to address these fundamentals. Right. It you has know, been a very difficult year for the education sector. Right. So, Prof, I, I believe this next question really fits uh, your pedigree as a professor of economics, former vice chancellor with academic experience, even outside Nigeria. And it's sort of maybe uh, looking closer at one of the bigger issues we faced last year. What did we get wrong with public universities that made us record prolonged ASU strike last year, maybe in the area of funding, administration, and all of that? It's not just what we did wrong last year. This has been long in coming. It's a gradual development of a period. If you really want to trade this, you have to go back to the, actually to the mid 80s, when the philosophy of education changed, when the, the, the previous commitment, government a commitment to mass education, to socializing our university education, to ensure that every Nigerian child that has the potential to be educated up to the university level gets that. When we introduced the structural adjustment uh, program in the, the 80s, that changed. The, the, market, the economic philosophy became market-based, became private sector-driven. The whole philosophy changed. And it became difficult to situate the philosophy of uh, education into that. That contradiction had remained up to today. We fund the public sector from the budget. There are many demands on the national budget. There are many demands on the state budget. Had the state government cannot take all this money and plow into education, it has other contending, contending needs. So if you, want to, if you want public universities or public educational system to be based primarily on the budget, then you have to find a way of structuring the budget that will meet the demand of, of education. You can't want to have a socialized um, a university system. Well, you can't pay for it. You can't pay the salaries. You can't provide facilities. You keep on trying every year to budget and to, to, to give what you, what you think is a share that will go to budget. Other, other sectors also, also require money. We need money for health. We need money for development. We need money for all the, all, all the other things. So it's, it's not really a, a, a this year's uh, problem. It's a problem that we have allowed to accumulate over a long period of time. Right. The decision to allow private enterprise to come into the education system was a wise one. Uh, but I don't think sorry, the promotion of private uh, investment in education is actually promoted uh, effectively by the state itself. Okay, Prof, uh, I mean, it's not just tertiary institution. Yes, it gets all of the attention, but there are other levels. There's primary, uh, there's secondary. And let's just wind down uh, in less than 30 seconds with this one. That policy that was introduced, asking that uh, children should be taught in their mother tongue at the primary level, uh, is it implementable? Is it in order? Well, again, as a post-colonial state, it's going to be difficult. But if you listen to the experts in education, if you, they've always told us that, yes, that teaching in mother tongue at the initial level is very advantageous. Their research has shown that, yes, the child is able to perform better when he's taught in his mother tongue. Um, we didn't, as a post-colonial, we didn't start that way. We started with, you know, a foreign language. And that's the reason why we started with a foreign language. Mm. Uh, for us to turn it back now, the infrastructure you need, the teachers you need, the, the resources you need to build that base of, of is quite enormous. It's easier said than, than done. And the elitist nature of Nigerian society still tends towards you know, Western education, still, right. still tends to, towards Western, Western culture. And, and it's going to be, it's a laudable policy, yes. Right. But I think it will be quite difficult to implement. Well, Professor Michael Kwanashi, former Vice Chancellor of Veritas University and Professor of Economics, thank you so much for your time on the News at 10. Thank you. You're welcome. Still ahead on the news at 10, economic advisory firm Financial Derivatives Company forecasts Nigeria's headline inflation lowered 21.28% in December, its first decline in nine months ahead of the NBS official report. Well, that's some business news. Stay with us.
Now, with political campaigns just about midway through, some political players are of the opinion that there is no level playing field for some candidates, especially the candidate of the Labour Party. Now, while speaking to the media in Lagos, convener of the Big Ten, Professor Patutomi, chronicles the effect of what he describes as the unfair political environment, citing some hurdles which he says impedes candidates of the Labour Party from campaigning. And so it's important when we see frightening trends that we speak up so that something can be done to nip them in the board. In traveling around, I have seen a frightening level of intolerance of opposition. As I speak to you today, the Labour Party is supposed to have is Delta rallies on Monday. The government agencies have done everything to frustrate use of any government facility for this purpose. The stadium, the, this arcade, this, the, that. Total frustration. Of course, they won't write a letter and say won't. They will just play games until they dis, you know, make it you know, un, uh, impossible for you to organize yourself. I think the Nigerian people should begin to hold governors accountable and bring them to trial after their tenure, if not in Nigerian courts, in international courts, because the level of irresponsibility and incivility in their action is really now an international issue related to democracy. Well, Linda Akibri is here from our Abuja studio with more stories on the news at 10. Beautiful evening, Linda. Good evening, Kaya Day. Now we head over to River State, where Governor Nyesom Wiki of River State has asked the new board of the Niger Delta Development Commission, NEDC, to do things differently and adopt a holistic regional development approach in its work. Governor Wiki stated this when the new board of the NDDC paid him a courtesy visit, marking the beginning of the official assignment to provide solutions to the socioeconomic issues in the region. He also urged the board members not to allow pressure from politicians distract them from their mandate. I mean, don't we set our conscience? That while I was there as managing director, while I was there as chairman, I put my feet down that no, this is not what it's supposed to be. Development of the people of Niger Delta. All you see is political contracts. Somebody's living here, you go and do a road of 50 meters leading to his gate, to his gate. Is that the duty of NDC? You come to my state, you don't even know the priority of my state. You won't ask question. You go and you go and begin to touch my school as if that is my priority. You don't lay heads with state before you do project. You sit in your office, conceive project without input of the state. You can't even come and say, look, river state, what is your priority? What do you want NDDC? What project? We are not saying give it to the state to do. That's not what we are saying. We can ask, okay, say this road is about 30 kilometers. It's a bridge. It's very key to the economic development of the state. So we know that it was NDDC. In her response, the chairperson of the commission, Mrs. Loretta Onochier, says the visit was to seek Governor Wike's support so they can replicate his kind of projects in the nine states of the Niger Delta. We are here to ask for your guidance. You have seen and you know and you have spoken about the the poor services that NDDC has been known for. Trillions of Naira has been pumped into this uh, commission and we have little or nothing to, share, uh, to, to show for it. We are here now uh, determined, very determined to do things differently. And uh, with you, 
with what we have seen in Port Harcourt here, we know we have you, we have you as our guide, as our advisor, so that you can advise us and call us to order when you see us going astray. We want to emulate what you have done in Port Harcourt and see if we can replicate it across the Niger Delta. Meanwhile, the River State Governor says residents must be courageous in scrutinizing the antecedents of those standing for elections and the vote should be for the people who have honored their social contract. We are speaking at the flag off of a road construction in Abwa, Odwa, local government area of the state. Communities in Odwal River State are being remembered as the state government flags off the Ikiago Boloma Adada Link Road after many years of promises by previous administrations. And to show their joy, the indigenes rolled out the drums to welcome the governor. The chairman of Abwa Odwal local government laments the state of infrastructure in the town but assures that this is the beginning of new things in the community with the visit of the governor, according to him, the first by a state chief executive since the return to democracy in 1999. We are indebted to you. At this place, we are indebted to you to give our vote. Because by the history, we came here in the 70s and he landed at Emelago and left. After as Pif, Okino only came for campaign. Throughout his government, he didn't come again. I will come with my people because I want to put your footprint here at Chicago. We all will come to your house and you match it. I will lay here for hundreds of years for people to know that Wike was the man that came and opened up Odwell. The 9.2-kilometer road to be flagged off on a virgin path is said to have been designed to withstand the effect of the devastating flood in this area. Before making his speech, Governor Wike seizes the moment to query the contractor handling the project on why he is yet to mobilize the site two months after receiving the first tranche of payment. This company has collected the money more than two months ago, and you are telling us that they are preparing after they sent money from us. Let them not move to start till tomorrow. I will sack you as a commission of work. The governor further explains that the construction of this road is in fulfillment of a promise made by his administration. We have been playing politics. People have made promises. Nobody has come to fulfill the promises. But we have made promise and we have come to fulfill the promise we have made. <laughs> Seventy percent of Odwal in Abwa Odwal area of River State may have been connected by road when this project is completed, hopefully in the next four months. Away from the Niger Delta, the trend of individuals and families migrating is not new. But when a teeming population of youths move because of what they consider failure on the part of government or system, then it needs to be checked. This is the view of Nigerian-American professor of global affairs and politics, Oyetunde Odubeso Umede. She believes that migration will always exist, but it's the responsibility of government to make the country suitable for those that stay. You may leave one, one place, one location for a greener pasture somewhere else, but even in that greener pastures exists a unique problem that is unique to that location. So I understand people's choice of wanting to leave, to, and people have the free freedom of movement. So they can make the best decisions that they want for themselves and for their family. But at the same time, it would be a disservice to the country if a multitude of people are leaving because they feel as though the government is not providing their needs or their high levels of insecurity where they can't reach their fullest potential. That becomes a deficit for the country. And that's something that any government should always take a look at. If there are high levels of the population who want to leave but cannot leave, who risk their lives to leave, um, and who would rather live in a different country. We live in a globalized world. And oftentimes, people leave countries for many different reasons. It doesn't necessarily mean that 
the country is not functioning to the ability of what they you know perceive it to be it may be for personal reasons it may be for a variety of reasons so we have to take that into account that in the world we live in we have what we call boundaryless careerists right we have people who are independent contractors people who are working from home and work for another country in a different part of the world and so it's not only just external threats that push people to leave their countries the world that we live in oftentimes calls people to go to different destinations just because of the nature of their work or the nature of opportunities that may exist but the idea of course for any government is to harness the potential and the population that they have so you want to have that balance and that mind frame that yes globalization is there so it means that people are going to move there's a movement of people a movement of services a movement of goods that is bound to happen but at the same time let us make the environment conducive to those that stay to catch the full interview with professor oyetunde odubeso omede do you watch diaspora network on saturday at 7:30 p.m. Now, the Zamfara State Police Command has rescued 15 kidnapped victims, including two children, in the Magazu Forest area of the state. Given further details at the police command headquarters in Guso, the state capital, police spokesperson Mohammed Shehu says the victims were abducted along Guso Safi Road on New Year's Day when armed bandits blocked the highway and abducted commuters, seven of whom were women and six men. According to him, the rescue operation was conducted following an intelligence report gathered on the abduction of the victims. And that's all from Abuja. Now to Anne for Business News. Thank you, Linda. Hello and welcome to Business News. After months of persistent rise, Nigeria's headline inflation is now expected to decline to 21.28% in a month of December. And that's down from its current 17-year high of 21.47%. According to Financial Derivatives Company, the survey also projects the country's food inflation to ease by 0.17% to 23.95%. This is due to falling food prices and due to the harvest season, while core inflation is expected to accelerate madly from 18.24% in November to 18.42%. Meanwhile, the National Bureau of Statistics is expected to release the official inflation report on January the 15th. The Nigeria Security Printing and Minting PLC has reacted to reports about the quality of the redesigned higher denomination of currency notes. In a statement released today, the NSPM explained that the notes passed through the same printing process and finishing procedures similar to the current ones in circulation and are of the same substrate. And now to the stock market where more than 196 billion Naira has been regained from the previous loss recorded at the Nigerian exchange markets end of the first trading week in January on a positive note. Any John Mekwa has a duty. Thank you so much. Welcome to the stock market report. Well, a quick recovery at the NGX. After just one negative trade, the market recovered by 0.70%. And then we see the all share back to that 51,000 there. And the market gained 193 billion, looking from uh, what we see at the market cap. And this, of course, is to the joy of the bull. So this recovery comes from buy interest on FBN holding, which gained 15 cover to lead the banking counter to the positive territory at 0.23%. Also in that territory, we see industrial goods. That's thanks to Bois Cement and Dangote Cement. They were very, very active today. However, PZ led its counter, that's the consumer goods, to the negative. It lost one naira, 10 cover from its share price. And so that counter is down 0.6%. 8%. A mixed activity chart is what we also see, but outstanding there is value. Value is more than 300% higher than what it was yesterday at 7.45 billion naira. Overall, they've had a positive week, but we have 51 more weeks to go in 2023. 
hoping to be more positives. That's the stock market report. I'm Mini John Mekwa. It's back to you. That's business news tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Mwawodo. Have a wonderful weekend. It's back to you, Coyote. Well, thank you, Anne. Former President of the United States Donald Trump has been sued by a partner of a U.S. Capitol Police officer who lost his life a day after the January 6, 2021 riot. The lawsuit, which seeks $10 million in damages, states that Mr. Trump intentionally riled up the crowd that attacked the victim, Brian Sicknick. He was also accused of violating Mr. Sicknick's civil rights. Simon Pusey has more international news and around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the channel's studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. A unilateral ceasefire called by Russia appears to have had little effect on fighting on the ground, with officials accusing each other of opening fire on several areas. A Ukrainian rescue worker was killed in a Russian strike, while Russian state TV said the city of Donetsk was also hit. Russia ordered a 36-hour unilateral ceasefire to coincide with the Orthodox Christmas. However, Kyiv quickly rejected the request. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky saying the truce was an attempt to stop his country's military advances in the east of the country. The Republican leader of the House of Representatives, Kevin McCarthy, has yet again failed in his latest bid to get elected as Speaker in a paralysis of U.S. government not seen since the pre-Civil War era. Not since 1860, when the United States Union was fraying over the issue of slavery, has the lower chamber of Congress voted so many times to pick a speaker. Back then, it took 44 rounds of ballots. And that's why I am directed by the Democratic Caucus to advance the name of Hakeem Jeffries from New York as speaker. Republicans took over the House in November's midterm elections, but the impasse has left the chamber unable to swear in members or pass bills. A group of 20 hardline Republican lawmakers are refusing to give Mr. McCarthy Trump. the necessary 218 votes. My friends, when Donald Trump Jeffries. was president, Scarlett taxes Rita. were cut, regulations were slashed, energy was abundant, wages were rising, capital was returning from overseas to fund the dreams and ambitions of our fellow Americans, and the economy was roaring. What a contrast to what we have seen from this administration now. And so I rise to nominate Donald Trump for the position of Speaker of the House. Will the House be in order? Is my sincere fear that if we were to allow Mr. McCarthy to assume the speakership, that would not get done. That it would be business as usual and the very same things that have paralyzed progress for both parties would continue to shackle us to never ending failure. We can be better than that. We can raise our gaze indeed. Three security force members have died in clashes in the Mexican state of Sinaloa after the arrest of a son of notorious drug kingpin, El Chapo. <laughs> Furious gang members set up roadblocks, set fire to vehicles and attacked a local airport. The state governor said earlier 18 people had been admitted to hospital. Ovidio Guzman Lopez, himself alleged to be a leader of his father's former cartel, was captured in Caluacan and transferred to Mexico City. <laughs> Footage on board a plane that was about to take off shows passengers crouching and cowering in their seats after the plane was shot at. The airline said no customers or employees had been harmed. More than 100 flights were cancelled at three Sinaloa airports. Prince Harry has made a string of damning accusations against his family in a new memoir called Spare. He also writes that he and his brother begged their father, now the king, not to marry Camilla. And he talks candidly about drug taking as a teenager and killing Taliban fighters while serving in Afghanistan. The book officially goes on sale in the UK and US next week, but copies have already been bought in Spain, where it has mistakenly gone on sale. And Orthodox Christians in Istanbul have braced the waters of Istanbul's Golden Horn Waterway to mark the ancient Greek Orthodox rite to celebrate the Feast of Epiphany. Once a spiritual leader of the world's Orthodox Christians, Patriarch Bartholomew threw a wooden cross into the Bosphorus to set off the traditional race. With swimmers rushing to be the first to retrieve the crucifix. Meanwhile, 
in Bulgaria. Men donning traditional dress danced in the icy waters of the Tudza River in the village of Kalofa as part of their Epiphany celebrations. And men dressed as witches raced on boats through the canals as part of Venice's annual Epiphany Regatta. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the channel's studios in Lagos. Thank you, Simon. The Italian Football Federation has announced that all this weekend's matches under its jurisdiction will be preceded by a minute silence to honor Gianluca Vialli's life. The former Italy and Chelsea striker died aged 58 after a long battle with pancreatic cancer. Vialli was first diagnosed with cancer in 2017 and then for a second time in 2021, shortly after Italy's Euro 2020 triumph. He left his role with Italy in December, citing his need to undergo treatment for the disease. Vialli played for Criminonse, Sampdoria and Juventus in the 80s and 90s before joining Chelsea in the 90s. And Chelsea fans have paid tribute to club legend Gianluca Vialli, who has died from cancer. The fans laid flowers and dropped condolence messages outside Stamford Bridge for the former Italy forward. Vialli joined Chelsea on a free transfer in 1996 and became player manager two years later when Dutchman Ruud Gullit was sacked. Under Vialli, Chelsea won the League Cup and Cup Winners' Cup in 1998 and the FA Cup two years later. Liverpool manager Jurgen Klopp has confirmed that defender Virgil van Dijk is out for more than a month with a hamstring problem. The Netherlands international was substituted at half-time in Monday's 3-1 Premier League defeat at Brentford. Liverpool set to be without the 31-year-old for their upcoming FA third-round clash with Wolverhampton Wanderers on Saturday ahead of Premier League clashes against Brighton and Chelsea. Klopp said Joel Matip, Ibrahima Konate, Joe Gomez and Nathaniel Phillips are his other options at centre-back. European football's governing buddy UEFA has announced that Alexander Seferin is the only candidate for a third mandate as president. The 55-year-old Slovenian lawyer, who has faced a stern challenge to his authority from breakaway clubs trying to create a European Super League, will be re-elected at a congress in Lisbon in April. Seferin was first elected in 2016 and has also clashed with FIFA president Gianni Infantino, notably over the idea of holding the World Cup every two years instead of every four years. Now that's a wrap on Sports News. I'm Victor Mathias. Thank you for watching. It's back to Kaede. Have a great weekend. Well, thanks, Victor. And the main news again. Heads of the Independent National Electoral Commission and the National Youth Service Corps today discussed ways to ensure the security and welfare of core members during the forthcoming general elections. Also today, Governor Babagana Zulum gave the assurance that Borno State is 90% safe for the conduct of elections. It says voting took place in the state in 2015 and 2019 when the state faced a worse security situation. And a unilateral ceasefire called by Russia today appeared to have had little effect on fighting on the ground, with officials accusing each other of opening fire on several areas. And that's the news at 10 for tonight, everyone. Thank you for watching. I'm Kairo Kikulu. Do have a restful night.